bright, <laughs> these lights are so bright. Um, our reading this evening is from the book of Proverbs, and usually I would ask you to get your Bibles out, but so, so don't, don't, and don't even rush to get your phones out, because we are, while we're reading from the book of Proverbs, we are all over the place in Proverbs. These, these verses um, have been gathered together. So I think it's up on, it might be up on the screen. If it's not up on the screen, please just sit and, and listen. And as I read these words to you, what I would like you to do is to, to think um, every time you hear the word desire or every time you hear the word fear, because those are the two words that we're going to be focusing on this evening. So let me read to you from the book of Proverbs. And it says, what the wicked dreads will come upon him, but the desire of the righteous will be granted. The righteousness of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their lust. Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. A desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but to turn away from evil is an abomination to fools. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Be not envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, for their hearts desire violence and their lips talk trouble. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Love not sleep, lest you come to poverty. Open your eyes and you will have plenty of bread. Whoever loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves wine and oil will not be rich. A gracious woman gets honor and violent men get riches. A wise man is full of strength and a man of knowledge enhances his might. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. This is the word of the Lord. And just before um, I start to, to open these words up to you, um, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word for these ancient words that speak directly into our day. We thank you for their truth, the treasure that they are to us. And Lord, in these moments, by your spirit, I would ask you to speak these words directly into our hearts, that we would hear by your spirit what you need to say. And Father, I offer up to you the ponderings of my heart over this last week. I pray you will do with my words as you will, and that by your Spirit, you will help me to speak in your name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So last week, Clive was looking at understanding our heart and this week, I'm going to look at understanding our desires, or the title is Reordering Our Desires. And as we continue on in this series, we can see uh, that it was a very wise person who said this. Um, now, I'm not sure who exactly did say this, or if somebody did say it, and, and I, I've made it up myself, but I do think I remember somebody saying that the affairs of the heart are very complex. We are very complex creatures. And I wonder, have you ever thought that you've really known somebody? And then they go and do something very bizarre. And then you're left wondering, did I really know that person at all? Or even yourself. I want 
wonder, have you ever done something and you can't even explain why you've done it? Or what about being moved to tears or being moved to anger? And yet, you don't know why, you can't explain it. I mean, even in this past week, as we've been listening the, the uh, news correspondents interview people at the various palaces where they're laying flowers, um, and I'm not trying to be sexist here, but it seems to be a lot of the gentlemen that they're interviewing are saying, you know, I was quite shocked at how I reacted. I, I didn't expect to feel this way. Um, our heart is a very complex place, isn't it? And the theme of these verses tonight, as we look at reordering our desires, talk about our desires and talk about fear. And I'll explain a little bit later on why it's desire and why it's fear. You see, to apply these words that we've just read, we need to actually go into the hidden uh, subconscious level of our being because that's actually where our desires and our fears reside because we don't understand why we do what we do. Sometimes we don't understand what motivates us and what drives us because it lies in the subconscious region of our brain and even of our heart. And you see, one of the ways to reorientate your desires is to actually understand where they come from. We, we read there in one of the verses that desire without knowledge is not good. So what we're going to do just firstly is to try and understand where um, these desires come from in looking at what is a human being? What makes us the way we are? And whenever we're trying to, to look at that, we have to look back away over hundreds of years, thousands of years, um, to all those cultural influences that, that, you have, that have seeped into you that tell you what kind of a human being or what a human being is. So way back we had the philosopher Descartes and he really got himself into a dreadful lot of angst about trying to figure it out, you know. What did it mean to be human? And he eventually came to the conclusion, and you've probably heard this before, I think, therefore I am. So the philosophers way back then said that we were thinkers. That's what made us human. And then when you go forward um, a number of hundreds of years, you get Martin Luther and the Reformation. And not long after that, then you get the Enlightenment, the scientific revolution. And then that was all about our beliefs, what we knew to be true, what we believed in was what we could see and what we could know. But you see, the thing is that knowing something and even believing something doesn't guarantee that you will act accordingly. And just to give you a very simple example, which I'm sure you're all very aware of, right? We all know what a healthy lifestyle is. We all know that fruit and veg are better than chocolate or a carry out Chinese, right? You know that, but does that stop you on a Friday or a Saturday night when you take the notion for carry out Chinese? You want it, you have to have it, you bring it, and it arrives at the house. You might regret um, eating it, but at that minute, in your heart's desire, you want the Chinese or the carry-out pizza. And you see, what social sciences um, are actually now admitting to is something that the Bible has claimed all along, that it's fundamentally about the heart that you and I are not primarily thinkers. We're not even primarily believers. We are fundamentally lovers. To be human is to be orientated by love. And then desire is what gives the structure to that love. Now that's not to say that we're not thinking beings or we're not believing beings. That is part of who we are. But at the very base level of how we operate and move in this world, we are formed by our loves and that's expressed in our desires. But the difficulty of this is that, as I've said, this happens in the subconscious re regions of yourself. 
And so one guy I was reading describes it like this. He says, it's like at the center of our being, there is a love pump, which is maybe why it, that connection of the heart, right? This love pump. And he says that it purrs away constantly beneath the bonnet. And it can never be switched off not even by sin or by the fall, but rather it's the effect of the fall, it's the, the, the effect of sin knocks our love pump off kilter. And that is actually why we need to be constantly rechecking and reorientating our desires if we want to live a godly life. Because a God-shaped life, a godly life, in a fallen world doesn't just happen. And this is where the Proverbs that we've just read help us to look at our desires and to see the impact that they have on us. And then what these Proverbs also identify is the heat that fuels our desires. We always think of desires in terms of heat and of warmth and of flames, right? And these Proverbs that we've read identify actually what stokes the fire of our desires. And the way Proverbs does this, the way it teaches us is that it paints a contrast. It always gives one thing and then gives another. And one of the beautiful things about Proverbs is that it's applicable to any culture in any time. It is written in such a way that you can read it, but the author leaves it up for you to apply it to your particular situations. So these verses that we've just read, they contrast the desires of the righteous and they compare that with the lusts of the wicked. And it actually warns us then that these desires can be dangerous. These desires, if we act on them, can cause us to lose our way. We can get lost in life. And then it contrasts the fool who refuses to turn from destructive desires. Even though they know they're destructive, the desire is so strong that they want that way rather than the fulfilled godly desires. And then when we look at what actually stokes those desires, what raises the heat, these Proverbs tell us that it's fear, that fear is the fuel and it contrasts the fear of man with the fear of God. And it describes having the fear of God as bringing us safety and security against the fear of man that is actually a snare or a trap. Now, when we talk about this kind of fear, we might have in our head when somebody says you're being fearful, that it's, you know, nail-biting and gut-wrenching terror. When the Bible talks about that kind of fear, it's not that nail-biting terror. A way to, to think of it differently is actually to ask a question. And the question is, whose opinion of you most matters? Who do you want to please the most? I mean, we've just been described there as lovers. And love will always desire a response. Love always needs to be quieted. So the question is, whose love do you actively seek? Who do you desire to delight in you? Or who do you desire to delight in? And the Proverbs set it out quite clearly. Is it man? that you seek to delight in? Is it the fear of man or is it God? Because this is the ultimate question of how you live your life. Do you live out of the fear of man or do you live out of the fear of God? Because the answer to that question and how you live out the answer to that question will determine your destiny. And the Bible tells us plainly, not just in Proverbs, but through the whole, the whole range of Scripture, that the fear of the Lord and the fear of man are two very, very different things, and they lead into very, very different directions. 
And the thing is that when we operate out of these desires, out of the delight of man, rather than pursuing God, there's, there's actually a number of ways this can manifest itself that these Proverbs show us that we're going to look at. So firstly, we can be, because of the fear of man, we can be driven anxiously to seek approval from others. And whenever we desire to seek approval from others, that causes us to compromise our values and our beliefs because it's more important to us to be liked and to fit in. And sometimes it's different in di different situations. For me, one of the things that, that really um, winds me up because of my love for Jesus is to hear people use his name as a swear word. You know, I, I often say to myself, Elaine, how can you come and stand here in church and put your arms in the air and say, what a beautiful name it is, what a powerful name it is. And then I go down the street and somebody just uses it like a swear word. But sometimes, two different scenarios, one where I did act out of the fear of the Lord and one where I acted out of the fear of man. So a few weeks ago, I was in the steam room in, in the gym and I was enjoying the heat and enjoying the quiet and the door opens and what I could vaguely see as a young guy walks in, but as the heat hits him, his expletive was to blaspheme the name of Jesus. And you know, in a split second, you're there, well, will I say nothing? This is my Lord he's talking about. And maybe because it was dark, maybe because he was younger than me, I did speak up. And I said to him as gently as I could, excuse me, but I actually find the way you use that name very offensive. And he didn't shout back, you know, and it's sometimes when you have those interactions, you think, you know, goodness, maybe I should be more braver. You know, people are not going to go down my throat. You know, maybe we do need to be braver. So he came in and he sat in the steam room and there wasn't another word out of him. Um, but when you put me maybe in another situation, like my local coffee shop in my local village where I have grown up, and I love going to this coffee shop. It's like nearly going to your own kitchen. Everybody knows your name and they know exactly the way I like my coffee. And the owner comes over to have a chat with me. And he's a lovely gentleman. And he said to me one day, I can't believe you're gonna leave Cross Scar whenever he knew I was coming here. But what happens whenever he does the same thing that the guy in the steam room does? Do I speak up? No, I don't. I act out of the fear of man because I like this guy. And I think he likes me because he comes to chat to me quite regularly. And that's the way I want it to stay. So I don't want to say anything that's going to upset the apple cart. And in that situation, I act out of the fear of man. And then the other thing I was thinking about as I was thinking about this seeking approval, um, particularly whenever you move a lot in Christian circles and your friends are Christians and you spend a lot of time around church and around church people. I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just me, but sometimes when you're in groups of people with other Christians, you can actually desire, out of your desire for approval, to make a good impression with other Christians. And you maybe talk yourself up a wee bit because you want to appear more spiritual. It's the same thing. You want to fit in. You want to be liked. But it's the fear of man, not the fear of the Lord. And I had an experience of this last year. Um, whenever I was, I was here as, as deacon, and we would have to go down to Dublin uh, uh, once a month. And the deacons all had to take their turn at preaching at the college um, Wednesday evening service. It was always the big event of the week. And I headed off to Dublin. It was my turn to preach. I had prepared my sermon. It was nerve wracking enough having to preach to your uh, colleagues and your tutors. But, but anyway, I went down this, this morning and the head of the college came over to me at, I think it was lunchtime. And he says, Elaine, have you heard the good news? 
And I, I, I thought I would be smart. And I said to him, oh, the good news. I know the good news. And he says, no, 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 the good news. Um, he says, the Archbishop of Armagh is coming this evening. He says, and, and uh, you'll be preaching to him. So I put on a bit of a face anyway, and, and I think I said something like, well, the, he's going to get whatever I have prepared. I mean, it's not going to make any difference. But that's not really what happened inside in my subconscious desires and my subconscious fears. Because when I got into the chapel, as they call it, down in Dublin that evening, and it was time for me to come to the reading desk to preach, the first thing I did was I forgot my water. I forgot my wee cup of juice over at the other side of the communion table. My mouth ended up as dry as a desert. I, and I know for somebody who, who likes the blither, I actually found it difficult to speak. My lip got stuck on my tooth. And I was actually so nervous I couldn't take my hands off the reading desk to go up and start to fiddle with my lip. And I know, I know I have your sympathy, right? You probably would be the same in that situation. But really, when you analyze it, I, all I wanted to know was, what does the Archbishop think of me, you know? That I was operating out of the fear of man. And I was so concerned about what this other man thought of me that I didn't even time to think about the one who I really love. What was he thinking? What was he thinking about the words that I was saying in his name? And then it talked about in the passage that we read about the envy of man. And the envy of man within us can cause us, as these Proverbs teach us, to seek and desire pleasure and wealth, particularly when we see the rich and famous or, or somebody down the street who has more money than us. And we can desire what they have. And I wonder, do you ever sit at home and watch those programs about luxury homes and luxury hotels? And I think, I haven't watched it, right, but I think there is one on luxury yachts. And I wonder, do you, even just for a moment in your imagination, entertain that thought, oh, I wonder what it would be like to live a life like that. I could see myself living a life like that. I would like that comfort and ease that the rich and the famous and the powerful have. And whenever we have that, even with people that we hang out with, we have to ask ourselves that. And it's a hard question. Who do you emulate? Who do you allow to influence you? Who do you watch? Who do you follow? Um, who do you look up to? See, the Proverbs highlight how the fear of man then can also cause us to seek power over others. We can see powerful people. We like it and we think, I'd like to, I'd like to have a bit of power like that. So we can seek power over others. But then these Proverbs also in the last verse that we read talks about control over our own fears. We want to be in the driving seat, even subconsciously. We want to be in control, the captain of our own ship. And sometimes we can do these things and follow these desires and we're not, even subconsciously, we're not realizing that they are chipping away at our godly character. I mean, we, we know the familiar story. There are many stories I've watched, documentaries of, of very rich and wealthy, powerful people. And whenever they're doing the biography of them, often with some of them, there has been a traumatic event, um, a childhood event where they have been perhaps humiliated or They've realized they've had nothing before this powerful and wealthy person. And then what they have done is they have made it their life's effort never to be in that situation again and to make sure that they become powerful and wealthy. And then we read in the last verse about boasting about tomorrow. 
I don't know about you, but I, ha I know a couple of people um, whose life planning and life management is so organized that they have everything on a spreadsheet. Now, it's a joke and we laugh about it, but they have everything down to a T on their spreadsheet. I see some people laughing, so maybe there's, maybe there's some people like that out there this evening. And there's nothing wrong with being organized. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being organized. It's good to be organized. But you know, and even maybe you're not even into that much detail of the spreadsheet, but you have a definite plan and you know where you're gonna be next week. You know where you're heading next year. You know where you want to be when you retire, what you want to have, and you will work at that. You will follow that desire without a thought. You may talk about it, but without a thought of the sovereignty of God, because your desires, that, that love pump, purring away and pushing you in that direction. Because these desires for acceptance and for pleasure and control that the proverb talks about, they are very, very powerful and they can really burn within us. And it all comes out of that living out of the fear of man rather than the fear of God. Now, I know that this seems, I mean, even when I was writing this, I thought, goodness, this is all very negative. This is very heavy stuff. And really, if you're going to say all that, you know, people might be right to say to you, well, Elaine, I'll just not bother getting out of bed, you know? I mean, if I've got this love pump and I can't turn it off and there's nothing I can do about it, um, I think I'll just stay in bed. So it, it is very heavy and, and negative. But what I want to say to you as well is that these desires are not necessarily wrong in themselves. Because whenever we go back to Genesis, those desires are actually within our DNA because we were made to live in harmony. We were made to get along. So to want to get along with someone is part of your God-given design. We were also made for pleasure. Didn't God say it is good? And can you imagine Adam and Eve in the sinless, beautiful paradise of that garden and what that did to their senses, the pleasure that they would have enjoyed in that perfection, and indeed the pleasure that they had in each other, with each other. We were designed for pleasure. And to a certain extent, God commissioned us in Genesis to be powerful and to take control. Now that was in a sinless garden because God tells us in Genesis, go and multiply, go and steward the earth. But the difficulty is that the whispers of the enemy in the garden are the same whispers that he still whispers to you and me. And the thing is that when we listen to those whispers and when we act on those whispers and we let those whispers filter into our desires, it just sends our desires completely off kilter. And ultimately, if we live out of those desires, they destroy us and they destroy the people around us. And then the really, really sad thing is that when we live out of those desires, we miss out on the pleasure of being in an intimate relationship with God. And that's why we need to reorientate our desires. That's why we need to reorientate our desires constantly in the right direction. You know, it's the Christian life. I said to somebody this morning at the back of the church, you know, it's a battle, not a picnic. You know, you don't just become a godly person. And Proverbs warns us when they, he puts those two contrasting pictures. And to live a godly life is something that you have to give yourself to. It's not about coming to church on a Sunday and ticking the box, so to speak, and thinking, yes, I am a Christian, I go every Sunday but it's your day and daily practice of how you live. We, we sung there this evening, there's nothing better than you. I think that was the line, wasn't it? There's nothing better than you. 
And in these moments, like I sung it, I really meant it, like I am sure you did. But what happens on Tuesday afternoon or Thursday morning or Friday night? Do you feel the same way? We have to fight it. So you might say to me, well, okay, right, so we're in a battle and we've got all these desires. What do we do? What is the solution? And you see, whenever you read the book of Proverbs, that's actually the nub of Proverbs. That's what it's concerned about, this wisdom to have these skills for godly living and to identify our habits that control our desires. And the good news, I'll give you the good news first. The good news is that whenever you talk about skills and whenever you talk about habits and you listen to the book of Proverbs, skills can be learnt and habits can be trained. But the difficulty is, this is the difficult bit and it's not rocket science and you would be able to tell it to me as easily as I can tell it to you. We know that this is what the solution is. And Tim Keller commenting on those verses that I've read says it like this. He says, it's only if we cultivate our relationship to God and grow the desire for him, will all other desires not entrap us. So he uses words like cultivate and grow. And again, that doesn't happen overnight. That is something that has to be practiced and worked at You don't just become obedient. You have to learn how to become obedient. And he goes on to say that the way to do that is to set your heart on God in prayer, in worship. That's how we reorientate ourselves. Come to God in prayer. Come to God in worship. Come to God together in worship and put ourselves before the beauty of his holy word because that is what will fuel godly desires. It's not difficult, you know those words, pray, worship, spend time in his word. But the question is, do you want it? Do you want it? And and maybe in these moments you'll say to me, yes, Lena, I really do want it, I really do want it. But that's where the commitment and the discipline comes in on Monday morning, on Wednesday morning, because you have to say, do I want to give myself to this life's quest? Because it is a quest. It's something to be pursued. It's not something that will just happen to you. Do you want his favor? Do you want his delight? Do you want to be filled with awe and wonder and to know that holy fear? Then you must spend time with him in prayer and worship in his word, in community. So I want to leave you with a few challenges to do this week as we think about that. So I would just challenge you this week to listen to yourself. Um, I know some people might say, would you ever listen to yourself? Well, I'm gonna say to you this evening, would you ever listen to yourself? So listen to yourself in conversations, in your interactions with people. And just be aware, are these conversations, am I saying this because I want to be liked, you know, I want, I want their approval. And then maybe like Nehemiah, even in those situations, you want to just shoot up a prayer there and then, just to acknowledge yourself before God, to say, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, I was seeking their approval rather than yours. And then as we think of pleasure and the lure of the seduction of pleasure, watch the adverts on TV. I think the the ones that are the most obvious are those dreadful perfume adverts that drive me scatty. Um, You know, you're gonna spray this perfume on you and you're gonna look like your woman. Well, it doesn't happen. Um, See how they, they, they seduce you into this wanting pleasure and comfort, wanting wealth and materialism rather than wanting the Lord. And then whenever we think about control, I imagine most of you, I know I am going to be, any free moment I will be watching the television. Um, The planning that goes in to this state funeral, 
Because at the end of the day, no uh, minister of the Queen was able to put this appointment in her diary. Because even the Queen had to come home when she was called. And think about, as you go about your daily life, who is ultimately in control? And here's another challenge for you. This is, I'm going to suggest to you to read, to pray, the collect, it's called the Collect of Purity. Um, it's one that we, we read whenever we come to communion. And for me, I think it is the most beautiful prayer in the prayer book. And it's one that I have learnt off heart now. Now, I'm not going to test myself. I have it down in front of me, because as sure as you're all sitting in front of me, I'll forget it. And it's that prayer that says, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of my heart by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that I may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. And I've changed it and put it into the first person. And I'm going to challenge you to, when you open your Bibles in the morning, to pray this prayer. Usually this is what I do, unless there's something really on my heart and I go dive straight in. This is the prayer I pray before I open God's Word. Or before you leave the house, and you can bring it up on your phone, just type in the Collect for Purity. Um, I was going to say you could pray it in the car, but if you need to read your phone, don't, don't do that. Um, but you can do it at your desk, you can do it um, in, the, in the coffee shop, because ultimately, this prayer encapsulates how we reorientate our desires, because we come honestly with these desires. We come honestly to the one who we know sees directly into our heart, the one who knows our desires, the one who knows our fears. And we put ourselves before him, and then we ask him to cleanse us with his Holy Spirit. And then we are able to delight in him and to magnify his name on Monday through Saturday before you come back here. So I challenge you to, to pray that prayer every day this week and see See how that affects the desires of your heart. And then lastly, I just want to leave you with, this is a paraphrased version of 34, and it just encapsulates everything that we've been talking about. And it says, the angel of Yahweh stooped down to listen as I prayed, encircling me, empowering me, and showing me how to escape. He will do this for everyone who fears God. Experience for yourself the joys His mercies give, the joy His mercy gives to all who turn to hide themselves in Him. Worship in awe and wonder all you who've been made holy. For all who fear Him will feast with plenty. Even the strong and the wealthy grow weak and hungry, but those who passionately pursue the Lord will never lack any good thing. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we have been fearfully and wonderfully made, that you have placed our heart within us, and Lord, that you desire the affections of our hearts. And so Lord, maybe in these moments, we would just open ourselves up to the whisper of your Holy Spirit. Maybe to put your finger on something in our lives that we are living out of the fear of man when you want our whole heart. Lord, help us. Help us to seek pleasure in you. Help us to be loyal to you. Help us to speak up for your truth and for the honor of your name.
Holy Spirit, strengthen us. Strengthen us so we can direct the desires of our hearts to you. Come and reign. Come and take the affections of our heart. We know there is no one better than you. We know there is no one who gives us safety and security and love like you do. So help us to reorientate our desires this week, to be in love, passionately in love with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Why don't we stand